Well, welcome everybody to, this is the third ESOP roundtable in the series that The Great Game has been putting together. My name is Victor Aspengren. They've asked me to facilitate this one again, so this will be my third facilitation. So this uh, is ESOP as a legacy. So we've got some guest panelists here and welcome everybody. We've got the chat down there. If you have any questions or any thoughts as we go along today, feel free to put those in there and we, we can address those questions and or thoughts. So to get started today, let's uh, do introductions. So we'll go with into the room, into the view with two people. So I'll go with Shane first. Shane, would you like to introduce yourself and give us your background? Yes, so my name is uh, Shane Harms. I'm a supervisor at Newstream Enterprises, sister company of SRC. Um, started with Newstream essentially right out of high school. I went to uh, SBU for a year and um, came back to Springfield, got a job, flex time at Newstream when I was 19. And so been working with Newstream ever since. And then actually uh, Sunday was my 11 year anniversary. So I've been with Newstream for 11 years, uh, essentially held just about every operational position that you can hold and Currently, am a supervisor of about a 35-person uh, team. Great. So, Tom? Yes, my name's Tom Harms. I'm uh, Shane's father. I spent 30-plus years. I'm now retired from SRC, but I spent 30-plus years uh, with them, all in production. Uh, I started out in 86, uh, third shift, turned down uh, automotive engines for, for GM. And through my travels, I was a team leader, uh, group leader, supervisor, and uh, ended up as production manager at the heavy duty division. So I spent my, my total career uh, giving projections, putting numbers together, and uh, all of it was in production. And so, and, and you are now, when did you leave SRC? I retired in 2016, so I've been retired now for uh, close to five years. So that's why you look so young. Five years of retirement, you know, <laughs> age goes backwards from that. Did you know that? That's why. Yeah. That's, look that's at a, it, It's a good, clean living, Victor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There you go. That's right. Randy, please go ahead. Yeah, my name's Randy Spencer. Um, I am a veterinarian, have been for over 30 years. Uh, bought a veterinary practice that I had worked at shortly after I started there and uh, have uh, watched it grow, helped it grow from one man practice. Now we have uh, what's called our first pet veterinary centers, uh, three 24 hour uh, emergency general practice specialty hospitals. Uh, we have uh, just over 300 team members, uh, just over 40 veterinarians, I think about 44 now. Um, so things have become different than I ever knew. I mean, it's one of those things where you just sort of feel guided along, along the way. It's been a great experience. Uh, tried always to do, take really good care of our patients and our clients and our team along the way. And uh, so just recently, two months ago, uh, we finished the process of becoming an ESOP. So on August 16th, that happened. Uh, very, very exciting. Our, our team is super excited about it. We've celebrated it and now we're, we're getting to work. It seems like there's a lot of work involved. Well, congratulations on becoming an ESOP. Oh, good for you. So let me, I'll just kind of preface this and then we can launch into some stories and thoughts and everything. But one of the things, well, maybe I should give a little background on myself. I'm a recovering CEO of an ESOP. I'm a recovering HR director of an ESOP. I've held about every position you can hold within a company, inventory, warehouse manager, office manager. But at the same time, I'm a bit of a hybrid or some people would say mutt in the fact that I've also worked for an investment banking company in Chicago on the service side. I've worked in ESOP administration for RSM McGladry accounting firm. So I've been on both sides 
of the equation when it comes to employee ownership and specifically ESOPs. And one of the things over the years, I've been in this space since 1999. Uh, that's when I joined the company where I learned about ESOPs, but it was also the company where I learned about great game of business. I went to my first two-day session back in 1999 when I met Jack and Rich and the whole Gray Game crew. So I've been hanging around with them for a few years. I'm currently uh, the vice chair for the National Center for Employee Ownership. I've been a board member of the ESOP Association. I've been part of the board of the State Center's Employee Owner Expansion Network. And I'm also part of a group called the Cooperative Charitable Trust that's a think tank on employee ownership and more specifically aligned with worker cooperatives, which is another variation of employee ownership. But the one thing I just say, you know, ESOP is a legacy and I'll just kind of preface this and Randy, you could probably speak to this because you just went through it. But I say there's kind of a three legged stool when you think of an owner of a company on you know, they get ready to transition. So there's kind of three things that I say are really critical. One, everybody's got a number. You know, when you go to sell your company or quite frankly, Tom and Shane, when you go to retire, there's a number that we're working towards so that we can retire. And there's a number that's telling shareholders look at when they sell their business. So one's the financial. Two is what I call relevancy. It's how do you stay relevant once you're out of your career, as in your case, <clears throat> Tom, or Randy, in your case, how do you stay relevant once you step out of the business because you've been living and breathing this thing forever? And that relevancy is really important. And Tom, you've probably found relevancy, obviously, in retirement. You've had four years. You know, it's a process when you go from work to retirement. So that relevancy is, a, is the second leg. And then the third leg is really that legacy. It's what's the legacy do you want to leave for yourself, for the people in your company, for your coworkers and the community and everything else. So I, I look at it as a three-legged stool when you talk about that. So with that, Randy, maybe I can launch into you because this is all fresh for you. The emotion of the transaction, all the fun, jovial things of putting together the ESOP, but you've just went through this emotional. And what's your perspective on, you know, specifically the legacy? Because that's what this, this, uh, webinar is about. You bet. Thanks, Victor. Um, yeah, quite a process. I don't remember a whole lot fun or jovial, but it, uh, we made it fun along the way. It, there was just lots of, lots of paperwork. Um, in veterinary medicine, one of the things that's been happening is the buyout of veterinary hospitals. I mean, you see it in a lot of industries, the human hospitals, just talking even dentists. I mean, there's just a lot of groups, medical, non-medical, where you have large corporations buying out. And so there is truly a heart to veterinary medicine. There's reasons why we become veterinarians and that uh, nurses or technicians or CSRs, I mean, whenever people come to be hired on, they say, I, I want to do this because I love animals. And and uh, they, they find out not too long afterwards that there's always a, a a person, a client closely leased to that animal. That's not what they signed up for, but, but uh, you have to work with the people too. But for the love of animals and for serving people. And, and so that heart uh, pushes what we do. And, and the people there, I mean, you have to have money to live, but that's not the reason they do it. They do it because they love animals. They love serving and, and all of that. And so bring in corporations and all of a sudden there's a different priority. The priority is to the shareholders, to profit, to um, doing whatever it takes to make money. And, and that means changes in the way that veterinary medicine is done. And it, to me, that's the problem. That's, it's changing the heart of what, what veterinary medicine has been. And, and if anything, I guess that's at the center of what I want our legacy to be. Uh, I, I mean, one, we, we want to take the very best care of our patients and two, those great clients, we want them to have a wonderful experience and our team along the way, our employees, we want them to be successful and to be self-reliant and uh, all the things that we've done, great game, the ESOP are intended to get there for them. So that's a, at least a start to the conversation of why 
why we're doing that. I mean, there's a lot of other pieces involved. I can go through a lot of that, but I don't want to take all the time, Victor. No, no, that's great. And just, just for the audience, when did you became an ESOP here just in August? When did you start practicing the game? So the great game of business, we started in January of 2019. We actually visited uh, that very room that, uh, <laughs> see the war room, which I love that name. Uh, Steve Baker and that group back in, I think it was November of 2018 and joined in uh, 2019. And, and we did that intentionally with the idea of creating the culture first, the ownership, employee ownership culture and preparing ourselves so that we could go into employee ownership. We thought an ESOP, we didn't know that until we went through and looked at everything and it was the best answer for us. And so we, we made the jump. So we were about, what is that? Two, two, two to three years in preparation. And then we just pulled the trigger uh, August 16th this year. Great. So the game was kind of your prerequisite to your ESOP journey is getting that ownership mindset. So, so with that, Tom, I'm going to go to you. So let's go back to the quote beginning of your career. I believe you know, back in those days, there wasn't an ESOP right when you first started, was there? Or was there? I think there was, Victor. Was okay. Yeah. If, if it wasn't right when I started, Victor, it was shortly thereafter. So right at the same, basically, you were playing the game and the ESOP all kind of happened at once. Yep. yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I remember, uh, you know, it really caught my attention. That's when uh, SRC was still under just one roof. It was like where the heavy duty division is now. So uh, we really became dependent. We have the huge debt to equity. So uh, our company had a huge dependent on each other to do their job. And I can remember uh, Jack Stack was given our departmental meetings at that time. And he was talking about the ESOP and how if we st stuck with it and you know, played played our part in the in, in the game. You know that by the time we retired, we would probably be able to afford a new purchase a new home. And uh, you know, I was a little older, Victor, when I started. I was in the '30s, so I had done construction work and heavy labor work. And for somebody to say, "Hey, you you can have a stake in the outcome here. We'll teach you the rules and teach you the numbers, and uh, uh, hopefully we can set." Set you, you can help set yourself up for a great retirement. Yeah. So when you joined the company, you had no idea about ESOPs, I would assume. Is that fair? That's correct. Yep. And so you said Jack talked about it. So I can just going back because you guys have lived that journey for many, many years. How critical was it that the leader was talking about the legacy? Because, you know, back then, I remember when I was young, oh, you're talking about legacy and long-term it's like yada 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 yeah. where's the money in my hand what's this legacy stuff you know where, where were you at back in those young days when you first started well uh again victor when i started i was 34 okay. so uh, when, they, when they started talking about the legacy and creating wealth and ownership and whatnot it, you know it, it hit home with me you know, okay. I can I can make the effort with more with my mind as well as my back, and yep. uh, help this company succeed. And here's where we're going to be, you know, yeah. at the end of the journey. Okay. Well, then, Shane. Now you said you've been there 11 years. So, when you first started, did you because your dad worked there? Did you know ESOPs? Did you know this legacy thing or? When did it kick in for you or was it right when you walked in the door because you came from, quote, uh, employee ownership family? Right. You know, I, it took me some time, I think, to, to figure it out because, you know, I'm, I'm still a young kid. I'm, I'm getting a job because it's time to grow up. You got to grow up at some time. You know, you can't live at home forever. And so I as you know. My, my journey through Newstream, you start seeing things and it starts making sense and uh, things that, you know, my dad had done through just everyday life based off the teachings that, of the great game of business. You start looking back and realizing that, you know, based off what my dad had done, I was already had tendencies of, of thinking like an owner. And, you know, I think the ESOP really hit home for me. Um, whenever, 
you know, I, I had decided probably about three or so years into uh, my career at Newstream to go to a shareholders meeting to see what this, you know, ESOP with the stock price, that sort of thing was all about. And my dad's there, his buddies are there, you know, people I look up to, people I know through him, through, through my years at Newstream and a number of the stock price comes across, you know, the big screen and I see, you know, people, they lose their minds over it. And there's cheering, there's high-fiving, you know, we're, we're having a good time. And when I see that number, it, it, it kind of hit home in that moment that this is, this is a major deal. And this is a, a value to me that maybe I haven't really quite, you know, bought into yet. And I think from that moment, just knowing what it meant to so many people who had been uh, with the company for so long, it, it really hit home and it, it hit home how fortunate, you know, I was to be able to partake in an ESOP. Okay. So, Tom, when, when you took at your legacy, because now you, you can reflect back on it. You know, as you reflect back on your journey with SRC and everything, I mean, there's probably some words of wisdom or some moments in there where you had like the aha. And this would even go for Randy because Randy's just starting their journey now with the ESOP and with his whole 300 person team. There's probably some lessons learned that we could all learn from you as you went through it of maybe some pre misconceptions you had is like, oh, I was thinking about it wrong. And then this happened or just when did it really trigger? Like, when did that number, was it in the first year? Was it 10 years down the road? Was it 25 years down the road when all of a sudden the actual ESOP account balance, you went, I got something really cool here. Well, it was, uh, Victor was really hitting home when I was about 25 years down the road and accumulated some uh, uh, shares. But I would say as, as uh, you're going through the, uh, the process of, of getting uh, your seven year uh, verification or uh, what do I, what word am I thinking there, Shane? Uh, the vesting. Thing, the, the huh? Vesting? Yeah. Vesting, yeah. When I had my seven year vesting, thank you, Victor. Uh, and you can see that, hey, if I quit today, you know, I'd have this X amount of dollars to take, take to the bank and invest somewhere else or whatnot. So I think that's when it really, really hit home for me. And, uh, you know, through, through that process, I started understanding that the, the, con the ESOP contribution, the more shares that you can start accumulating for, uh, for your uh, uh, journey through SRC, the better off you were going to be in the long run. I wasn't so, so much interested at looking, looking, Victor, at that next year profit or loss or whatnot. I was thinking, of, man, if, I can, if we can keep doing well and the contributions from the company keeps going into your ESOP or whatnot, and, you know, 15, 20 years from now, I'm going to have X amount of shares. And if the stock grows, you know, it's, uh, we're going to have something special here. Mm -hmm. So as you, also, Tom, as you think about it, what, why do you think, because obviously you've got the benefit of, you know, you retired from it. It was a big chunk of your retirement. Does it, do you ponder why there's not more companies that don't do this for their people now that you've left and kind of completed the quote ESOP journey? Yeah, I absolutely uh, do, Victor, because to me, the success of a company is based on their employees. And the more uh, stake in the outcome uh, that you give your employees, the more teaching your employees of the rules, uh, teaching your employees how to keep score, uh, you know, it, it can do nothing but benefit the company. I mean, if you've got a, a workforce out there that are running blind, you know, don't know what the bottom line is or don't know where your expenses are or, you know, what your warranty is or your rework is or things like that, then uh, how can they help better that situation? Okay. So, Randy, you've been doing your 30 years, you said, right, when you started your company? And yes. when you started, when did you hear about ESOPs and employee ownership? Was this something that was part of your DNA for 30 years, or when did that, when did that come into your thought process? So ownership thinking was around for much of that time. I mean, you, there's books that you read along the path that help, help you to understand better. Um, but I mean, looking at some very successful 
companies. Uh, I read books on Mayo Clinic, on uh, Nordstrom, on Disney, and and seeing what they did for their people, and seeing uh, and for Mayo Clinic, for example, the the goal of the Mayo brothers in 1890s was to have a hundred year company. And I love that thought that sort of set some things in motion for me. I came across a book called ownership thinking just because I, that was my thinking uh, by uh, Brad Hams, who uh, had association with the great game. And uh, a lot of the principles were there. And I actually started trying to apply the principles. I started talking about it. That was the first place I ever heard of an ESOP. And so I joined NCEO right away and learned a little bit about that. But I presented an ESOP uh, clear back in February of 2018. I mean, I started reading about it in 2017 or so, presented it at one of our all team meetings. I've, I mean, I've, I had quite a few of our team members that came up afterwards and gave me a hug. I don't remember that happening, but looking at the future and that they had a chance to have a piece of this, they were just completely excited about that thought. So that's when it started. And, and then uh, NCO pointed me to this crazy book called Great Game of Business. And, and uh, that's where we jumped in head first and it's been wonderful. Yeah. Well, so you, you kind of had it in you. Uh, Shane and Tom, you guys walked into a company where you had a leader that believed in it, kind of like Randy. Jack believed in it from the very beginning. Randy did it there and he had his journey to get there. So one of the things that I find interesting, because you said it, Randy, and it kind of goes contradictory. You said, um, we have a group of people that love to help animals and the people that own those animals. And so, and so it wasn't about the dollars. It was about the mission and the values and the purpose. And what I always hear from SRC, and you got Shane and Tom, you correct me. It's always, I always hear about the ownership thinking. I don't always, I don't hear from employee owned companies like we made a gazillion dollars or we got to, we got to hit all these numbers. Yes, you practice the game and there are numbers you hit to drive value, but it's kind of, of a result of a belief or a thinking versus it's all about the money. And then we figure out the culture. It's, we kind of have this culture or belief and what's really important knowing because we practice the great game of business that we have to have a positive bottom line is that do i am i thinking about that wrong or does that resonate with all three of you yeah what i've told people for years is uh, i mean profit is essential it's like the blood you you have to have it or you die and so but it's not our focus and you talked about three pillars our three pillars are what i mentioned uh, patient care client service and the team that's that's you get those three right and you're successful and that's what's driven our culture and things for for many many years but profit is is important but not the central part of what we do shane tom yeah i, I mean I, I agree completely i i learned uh the first thing i did in leadership as a group lead i i learned the importance of knowing what my portion of the ownership was and my team's portion, because just going out and telling the team, Hey, here's, here's how many we have to produce. It's gotta be done by this time. You know, that doesn't benefit them. That doesn't benefit me. I can almost promise you, we wouldn't hit that number, but if I could show them the importance of it, you know, show them the value of owning it. Well, then I dang near hit every deadline that we set out there because the team knew what this individual had to do to, make this individual successful and so on and so forth because everybody realized you know like my dad alluded to the stake and the outcome they owned it they truly owned it so they could either you know lay down not give their best effort but the outcome would suffer because they didn't own it so ownership yeah for me through SRC through the great game of business it's it's always been there and it's been a big focus on how I attack each day Okay. Tom, anything to add, or you just nod your head? So maybe you said it. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, we uh, a lot of our goals, you know, at the heavy duty division was was based on profit, and within each subsection of the income statement, you know, you got your uh, uh, overhead spending, 
you're behind schedule, you're not operating expenses, you know, your taxes, all this, you know, all these little subdivisions here taken out of that income statement, you start with $3 million. And by the time you get to the bottom, the profit before tax, you know, you're at a couple hundred thousand. And, you know, to teach the employees, where, where is your, your contribution? How can we improve that number? You know, you can improve it through uh, less overtime, better warranty, better customer service, you know, utilizing your core better, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and uh, with the great game of business, a lot of our, our goals and in many games were based, you know, based on positive numbers, you know, absolutely. So if you were, you were having good numbers or putting forth the effort uh, to uh, help that profit before tax, then more than likely your, your bonus programs or mini games uh, were going to be very successful. Mm -hmm. well, one of the thoughts as I was thinking about all this to, to you know have this conversation with you guys is one thing is is here in the U.S. I mean ESOPs didn't really start till 1976 is when they passed the ERISA law. That's when the law got passed, but ESOPs really didn't start getting created till it was well into the 80s. So it's not like ESOPs have been around forever. I mean, you could say ESOPs have been around for maybe 30, 40 years. But really, it's been the last 30 years where we've really started to create this ESOP employee ownership. There's other, there's other types of employee ownership, worker cooperatives or trusts or just phantom stock or whatever you want to call it. But one of my thoughts was, is, and I learned this because I told you I was part of that cooperative charitable trust. So I've been fortunate to be able to travel abroad to other forms of employee ownership. And I was in Italy. This was back in 2005, I believe. And their model over there is worker cooperatives, but worker cooperatives have been around for generations. So we went and visited this manufacturing plant and we got, and we had the opportunity to go visit somebody who was retired, just like you, Tom. So we went to the gentleman's house and he was a single older gentleman. He lived in this little apartment. He had a little plot of land out front for a garden. And we come there and he pulled out the wine for us and we had the tomatoes and all this good stuff. And so we were asking him about, you know, why employ, why did you work at a worker cooperative when you could have maybe worked somewhere else and made a gazillion more dollars? And he said, he goes, I, I've got my place. I've got my little garden out here. He goes, once in a while, you know, I get to go out and have some fun with the ladies and the friends. And he said, but the most important thing is he goes, the reason I worked there is because it, it was it was a different way to run a business instead of the bottom line, as we've talked about. He goes, it was about the legacy. He goes, for my kids and my grandkids to have a really great place to work and for our community to stay solvent and everything else. And I found that very profound. I mean, he, he was in there. It wasn't about him. It was about his legacy for, for his family and his community through his work. So my question to you guys, I think I think we're kind of at that stage here, maybe in the U.S. ESOPs have only been around basically like a generation, and now we've got all these opportunities where it's the next generation for employee ownership, like an SRC. Randy, you're just starting the journey, and there's a lot of other veterinarians out there that could start the same journey to create this legacy because it is more of a longer term view. It's about sustainability. It's about creating something that builds value over time, but maybe it's not as grotesque. It's not all about somebody making a gazillion dollars and then they just walk away and whatever happens, happens to the employees or the community or whatever it is. So I just throw that out, um, food for thought on that, you know, do you, especially for, you know, Tom, Tom you and Shane, you, you guys are right at that cusp. It's a generational shift at SRC. Uh, do, you, do you see that? Is there more of that in SRC? I mean, you're just a you know one data point, but is is there a lot of people that have worked there now? Their kids, or maybe there are grandkids that are starting to work there. I don't know. Yeah, Victor, I'll I'll address that. You know, uh, when when I retired, there were several people ahead of me that retired, and obviously several people after whatnot. But uh, I've been uh, out of SRC for five. Well, I'll never be out of it because it's just part of me. But uh, for five years now, and I come back and I look at all the, you know, the additions and the improvements and what's going on with, 
SRC as far as businesses and buildings. It's I said, man, this all happened in five five years. I mean, we did build something special, and you know, I'm so proud proud to have Shane Shane working here because he's part of it. Uh, he gets it, you know, kind of like uh, you know, I got it. He he, he gets it. This is it's pretty special. And it's not just the you know the retirement money or this or that. Uh, uh, learning the income statement. Uh, it's a good group of people from from top to bottom that I worked with. They were they were special people, and that's what maybe brought in the whole great game of business or ESOP, you know, to uh, to fruition for me. You know that the, this is special, and we're all all in it, and we're going to do this. You know, and we've uh, we've done it. So, you know, and, and the celebrations. You know, it's just not about the numbers. We celebrate. We celebrate our wins. You know, we have anniversaries. We've had the Beach Boys, the Doobie Brothers. You know, we we give we give back to the employees on, on their successes and the company that we've been building. You know, I mean, I've been an Easter Bunny. I've been a Santa Claus. You know, we celebrate every occasion for people to bring their their families get together with uh, with uh, current employees, and I guess that's what made it so special for me, Victor. Well, I can resemble the Easter Bunny. I did that once too. Did, did you yeah. Now, when we did the Easter Bunny hunt in our employee-owned company, I locked the doors and then the, we had an Easter egg hunt and I left uh, chocolate-covered raisins throughout the plant, you know, the bunny had been through so uh, as they were hunting. But uh, anyway, so Randy, as you think, as you think about just starting your journey and, you know, and it's a long ways down, but obviously, I mean, your tenure, you know, you're not going to be there for another probably 30 years. Maybe you will. I don't know. But um, so you've got that transition in that legacy. Have you already started to think of how do you make sure that this thing lasts way past you and, and through multiple generations of, you know, your 300 people and their and their network? So yes, I mean absolutely. I've been that's that's been a lot on my mind before, and especially now. I, I mean we're putting our board of directors together, and so what that board does, those rules that are put in place. One of the things that I want to see is that First Pet is always veterinarian led. That was one of the tenets of the Mayo Clinic that they would always be doctor led, and and so that helps you to keep the heart if it's a a CFO or something like that, a CPA that's running it, then all of a sudden it is more about the numbers. So I, I want that to be part of the culture. Uh, so there's lots of decisions that are yet to come to, to produce that, that legacy. Uh, I mean, as Tom and Shane talked, I mean, that's, that's who we are too. We've long been more of a family feel with 300 people. It's hard to know everybody in the family anymore, but uh we, we're very clo closely connected and, uh, and it's, it really is a group effort to, to move forward in the future. And so wanting our team to, to uh, jump in and the leaders rise, that's what I love about the great game is it produces leaders that has prepared us for the future. And so I have a lot of people uh, to, to pick from. A lot of our doctors that have been leaders for some time. Uh, that's what it's about is putting those people in place that will, can, they'll just keep it going. Almost everybody we have in leadership, in fact, I think everybody has come from within. We, we've yet, we, we need to get some leadership from outside just because we need some expertise in a couple of areas, but uh, the culture is very benefited by people learning, growing, and becoming leaders, and then taking responsibility. And in all honesty, uh, there's not near as much that I do anymore. I, I mean, my part right now is, is more getting everything settled for the future, but it's still the vision. And that's what I've long brought to it is vision and implementation of, of that vision. But we brought people along such that, I mean, they don't need me right now. I mean, that's the reality of it. That doesn't make me feel bad at all. I, I can leave for a little while and it doesn't miss anything. So it's wonderful. <laughs> well, I think that's, I mean, one of my preferences of leadership has always been a good leader works their 
way out of their job from day one. Because you're right, if the organization's functioning and and you said it well there, you know, the great game of business, because in all the companies where I've been in an ESOP, we practice open book management too. And I do agree that it helps you build those leaders because it's risky when you bring somebody in from the outside to fit in. It's, there's always that risk where if you can build it within, one, it makes it stickier. You have those opportunities. And Tom and Shane, you both have shared, you guys have moved up over the years through great gain. You've had opportunities to move up in your career in, in that process. Is, and I think you would agree that you guys are pretty, SRC's got that down where multiple divisions have that same rhythm of creating future leaders. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, you know, shown pretty quickly that if I did a good job, that there was going to be um, an investment in me. And so as I moved through the company, you know, I, I got opportunities to go take great game of business courses. And, you know, I was taught, I've had uh, the benefit of having good leaders myself. And I think ultimately too, that's a huge uh part of the ESOP is having those right leaders in the right place that are totally bought in. Because if you, your teams are listening to a leader that isn't bought into the ESOP or a great game of business, well, what are the, you know, we're talking about a legacy. What, what are those people going to go tell their families or, and so on and so forth. And you kill that legacy. You have to have strong leaders who understand the importance of an ESOP and who are fully bought in. And I have been fortunate throughout uh, my career of having such leaders. And, you know, you um, talk about SRC and opportunities internal. I have never once thought about looking outside of SRC because the opportunity has always been there. I've always seen it. And I think that's a product of ESOP and ownership. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that's the power of the great game of business. And ultimately, the, the ESOP, they go hand in hand, but that Great game of business if you're practicing it, because if you're not growing, you, the adage of the companies, if you're not growing, you're dying. And, 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 and one, it could be literally you're dying because you're not making money, but you can also be dying because you have attrition and people don't stick around because they don't have opportunity. I mean, I think companies forget one of the themes of the great game of business is by practicing it, you're increasing the odds that you're going to grow your company and grow opportunities, which makes your organization more sticky. So people don't go look for the grass is greener on the other side, which you can't blame anybody for that. But if you're practicing the game, you're kind of creating your own grass is greener on the other side within your company. So people don't have to leave. I think it makes it a little more sticky. Is that, would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, to me, Victor, there's there's several benefits to SRC. I mean, you got the ESOP and your 401k and tuition refund. So all the individual really needs is the one. You know, the tools, the tools are there, the teaching, the training, uh, the opportunities. And if you have the one, you'll have a bright, you'll have a great opportunity to succeed. Right. And, and oh. Victor, I would just add uh, that this. For veterinary medicine, I mean, it's not just our company, it's throughout the whole nation and we're learning throughout the whole world that uh, during this COVID period, veterinary hospitals have become incredibly busy. We've been insanely busy, especially, especially as a 24 hour hospital. And, and with that, uh, there are not enough veterinarians, there's not enough team members. I mean, that's a problem almost all industries right now, no doubt about it, but we're, we're facing that and trying to take care of business. And so that stickiness that you talk about is incredibly important us and, and having the culture put us at a great advantage uh, during this time, because we, we don't lose many and we do attract the best and the brightest out there. We still could hire a hundred people tomorrow and probably put them to work. But uh, having said that the culture is, is able to, to help us really attract we i mean at the last emergency doctor uh convention they were offering a hundred thousand dollar signing bonuses for emergency veterinarians they were offering new cars i mean it, this is bribery up and down and and we just don't do that we just say look at us what we have what your future will be what it's like here and 
I mean, we hired in an emergency veterinarian just last week, and we've got another one that wants to come work out for us, and we're trying to decide if they're a fit for us. I mean, we're a little picky even about who we bring in, and so that that's what the the culture does. That's I mean, that's where a great game, but also ESOP. I mean, everybody we talk to, we're talking to about employee ownership and they're all excited and it is i mean you talk that versus here's a hundred thousand dollar signing bonus well i like that better and that's why that's why we're finding some some real good things happening as a result of of this combination yeah that uh the culture the stickiness it's um it we've got this issue it's going to be another 10 15 years of this worker shortage so it's not just attracting it's keeping people and that's gonna be really, really important. So one thing I'll just share, this was a number of years ago at an ESOP conference, actually it was in Kansas City where I facilitated a panel and we had three people that had left ESOPs, just like you, Tom, three people left. One was a bank teller. She had worked at the bank for 30 years as a bank teller. The second one was a CFO that had only been with an ESOP for about 15 years. And the third one was an engineer, just a rank and file, not a manager, just a rank and file engineer at an engineering ESOP company. So we were talking about the ESOP and, you know, we didn't say how much money did you get, but I said to him, I said, how much of the ESOP, what percentage of your retirement was your ESOP? So, you know, the CFO, obviously CFOs make more money and he'd only been there 15 years in an ESOP, but he said the ESOP, was 40% of his retirement income. 15 years, okay, CFO. Then I asked the engineer, how much was it yours? And he'd been there, I think 25 years. And he said, it was around 60% of his retirement income from, came from being in the ESOP and being a part of it. And then I asked the bank teller, I said, well, how much of your retirement? She said, 90% of my retirement is from working in the ESOP, but she was there 30 plus years. So Tom, can I ask you what percentage of your retirement was, was your ESOP? If you're willing, if you're not, that's okay. Uh, that's fine, just let, let me collect it for, for a second here. It was, it, it was probably, I would say around the 40%. 40%? Yep. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and uh, when I say that, Victor, because I was also a, big uh, uh, promoter of the 401k plan too with the, with the SRC match on your 401k. So, you know, if you, if you could, you know, have two, two kitties here going at the same time, uh, that would even make your uh, retirement that much, much better. So I didn't rely totally on the ESOP like a 60 or 70%, but it was a big part. I mean, a 40% is, is a big part of your retirement. Yeah. And then when you think about that, it's how do how do people that don't participate in ESOP, you think about how do they how do they put their money away? And you hear about the retirement crisis. It's out there. I mean, there's a lot of people that are totally underfunded and don't have a clue or maybe have never even had a clue of what does that look like or how do I get there? Which, again, goes back to great game of business. Not only you learn about the business, but you're learning for yourself and how this all goes together. And then the other side of, you know, the ESOP legacy, there's the cultural component and all of that. But part of the great game of business is making sure that you have the money to pay out the people like you, Tom. And that's not, you know, success breeds a lot of, of obligation for that whole group of people that have these big accounts. So part of the ESOP legacy, which some people say, oh, it's the downside. Well, I think for ESOPs where it was a downside, they didn't practice open book management. You know, you had a small group of people that were in charge of the finances, you know, your typical leadership team, but it wasn't the whole organization saying, we all got to work together because there's an obligation to pay out our retirees and we still want to build value. And guess what? If I'm Shane, I want to retire too and make sure that I get paid like dad did. So there's, that's another side of the legacy that the link between great game and ESOPs. And then when you throw in the legacy component, it's another three-legged stool when you say, what do we get the end of this career? If you don't have those three things balanced out, you can get yourself in a little trouble on that. 
Randy, I know you guys just became an ESOP, but have you guys already started thinking about that down the road obligations? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's certainly part of it is the, the repurchase obligation. I, uh, I mean, to me, this, yeah, I mean, is this, we're early on, we're, we're thinking about it, but uh, we've got to make sure things work well now. Yep. Uh, one of the things that I, I brought up in our recent celebration, we've done it in some other venues, there's just, I mean, that combination of great game and, and uh, ESOPs, but the, there was a study done at Stanford back in the 70s where they took kids, they were, looked like five or six year old kids, putting them, put them individually in a room, gave them a marshmallow and said, <laughs> if you, if you don't eat this, I'll give you a second marshmallow. They didn't tell them how long, but it was about 15 minutes. There was a video done where they reenacted this on, uh, on YouTube. You could watch it and I shared it, but you could see some of them put it to their mouth and some of them just ate it right away. They said, Ultimately, 70% ate it, 30% did not. But long-term follow-up on that study was that there was a very good correlation between those that waited and their future success, their ability to say, uh, I, I will wait for something better. And, and so we tied that into the ESOP. And saying that this is what this is about. This is about having those two marshmallows or many marshmallows later down the road. One of the things I find exciting is with the great game of business and that bonus, or we, we do call that stake in the outcome. It's all stake in the outcome, but that bonus uh, is the now and, and the ESOP is the later. I mean, to me, it's like having your cake and eating it too and getting our people to understand that and uh, that's one of the things that interested me about SRC. When we went and visited there, got to participate in a huddle, they spent a good five or six minutes with people that uh, like, like Tom that are getting closer to retirement and touting how, how important the ESOP was and that you needed to participate in it. And so I can see that it's an ongoing process of teaching and guiding and helping and encouraging uh, the the participation and the excitement about ESOPs, but I, I think both together are, are the answer, really. Mm -hmm. Tom, did you get excited on those uh, quarterly payouts over the years? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It, allows me to, it allows me to do my fishing, Victor. There you go. Hey, that's what it's all about, or do those fun things. <laughs> that's right. I, we've got a few questions here, so I'm going to pause for our stuff and just um, got a question here. Um, what is your investment period for your new people joining your ESOP? I'm assuming that's to you, Randy. What's your vesting? I assume it's probably the six year. Yeah, it's a six year vesting uh, percentage every every year going up. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so here's here's the loaded question. So how do you get new hires? to engage and buy into the ESOP quicker. And, and so for us, I'll, I'll answer it for first pet. Um, one, we talk about it in that opening interview. We, we want them to, to be interested in that. That's part of whether they join us or not. But then in our onboarding process, we start right off talking about the great game of business and and now ESOPs, I and mean, we have a video that we show about ESOPs telling them about it. And then, I mean, right away, they know that they're expected to be to our uh, weekly huddles, to our monthly huddles. The monthly huddles are absolutely required. Um, and so that our newer people are the ones that are more engaged than some of our older people. I mean, that's right, because of the process, some of the older ones were a little more hesitant and uh, we, we told them it's okay to be neutral. Just don't fight against it. We're, we're all in this together. So uh, anyway, that's uh, so far, I think we're doing well with that. I mean, that's something that takes effort and work and you got to keep that at the forefront to, to keep it going. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with Randy there. You, 
you just start from day one and it's repetition. You just keep, you know, talking about it, um, talking with people about it, because the more you talk about it, you know, it, it's going to make these new hires think, you know, it's important, which it is. And I think that goes back to what I said before. It's also very valuable to have strong leaders who fully believe in the ESOP because, you know, they're going to be talking to uh, these people and new hires. They may want to be in that person's position at one point. And if they're constantly talking about the ESOP, like we talked about, it, it becomes sticky. Yeah. And, and the one thing for the audience that I'll say for my years of being in this space, both open book and ESOP is if you, if you were not practicing open book, when you became an ESOP, it's a tougher, it's a tougher road for education. Cause if people don't understand the numbers and how this all relates to, you know, the bonus to the bottom line, to how you grow stock value, when you throw somebody in an ESOP and they haven't had any financial literacy and all of a sudden you start talking about stock value and growth People are like, what are you talking about? And it's a longer learning curve where if you're practicing GGOB, and I quite frankly anymore, I just say it should be a prerequisite for every ESOP to practice GGOB at least two years before they become an ESOP because you get a bigger bang for your buck when you become an ESOP because now they can put together the whole story. And, and I say this because in the first company I was in, there were no numbers shared with anybody. We became an ESOP and the ESOP was like, what's that? What does that mean? We did not trigger our ESOP power until we went to the great game and we started doing open book management. And then people started connecting the dots of what do I do today? How does that impact you know, the week, the month, the bonus? And you know, I always used to say, if we're handing out bonuses, folks, what does that mean for the ESOP? high probability the stock value is going up. Not a guarantee, but if we're not paying bonuses, then the stocks might be flat or start declining. But if we're paying bonuses because it should be a self-funding bonus, that should link to that stock going up. But it wasn't until we started doing the game that we, that we got that. Tom, do you have anything as far as your time or any tricks of the trade in your tenure there? No, I agree. Uh... Kind of what Shane said, you know, you've got to uh, just keep reinforcing uh, the great game of business and the ESOP through your departmental meetings, you know, your teaching, uh, the rules, and teaching the, teaching the numbers, etc. Uh, not everyone's going to buy, buy in, you know, uh, and you can't focus on that. There's, there's, uh, if you get a percentage, a high percentage at buy-in, you know, that's, that's a great accomplishment and, and be truthful with you, Victor. I got, you know, I'd spend at least an hour a day as a production manager on the floor, uh, hour in the morning, hour in the afternoon. And I would not, I knew who the doubters were. And anyway, I'd make it a point to, uh, uh, you know, converse with them one-on-one, -on -one, just in casual talking or whatnot. And they could ask me questions one-on-one -on -one without being in a group setting. And, uh, you know, I probably had as much success turning those people, you know, if, the light would come on for, you know, after a few of those, those encounters or whatnot, where we were able just to, you know, they'd be, be uh, at their work area and I'd be there talking, talking with them. And uh, it was starting to hit home, hit home with them, you know, because they knew I was sincere. Right. Well, that goes to the power of leadership. It just can't be the quote, the CEO or the president touting the importance of this. If you don't have that down through your levels of leadership throughout the whole company, Yep. then you're going to miss it because it's that special time right there because, Oh, here comes, you know, the seat, here comes Jack. Oh, who wants to listen to Jack? We hear Jack all the time. <laughs> then when Tom shows up, people hear in a different way and Jack will forgive me for saying that I've known him a long time, but it's just normal that, you know, yeah. the CEO, you, I was told Victor, no matter what you do, you can't get rid of CEO. It's there, and for some people, that CEO gets in the way of a good conversation, and that's where you need, while you need layers of leadership, especially the bigger you are, that can go in and have a different conversation than, quote, the CEO title, because it does get in the way sometimes. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Here's another uh, question. So talk to us about how to blend communication of employee ownership and GGOB without causing confusion as to what is the priority 
for our employee owners to focus on? Thank you. That's the question. So I, I think they, you know, they go hand in hand. You can use the ownership teachings and the great game of business at the same time. And I think if you're afraid that teaching that might blur the line, you would be surprised how um, teaching somebody to be an owner, actually the only effect is there's positives. Um, so you really, you know, you set that number and then you teach to be an owner and you'll be amazed at how many people actually latch onto that when they're actually know that somebody's looking at what they're doing, what their position entails with more intent than just you got to punch a hole in this or your, your job is this and that's it. Nobody else cares. You know, if you can show them the importance of owning that, it has direct positive effect to everything else. Okay. Yeah, I, I sp spoke a little bit to this just a little while ago, but I mean, to me, great game and an ESOP is synergistic. I mean, that means one plus one equals three. And so I think connecting them together makes all the sense in the world. Um, I think that uh, that stake in the outcome, I mean, that's to me, that is great game. ESOP is the retirement arm. I think you can separate it out a little bit that way and explain the uh, the difference between those two, but it both of them rely on employ or on ownership thinking, and and so one with an ESOP it goes from just thinking you're an owner to actually being an owner. That's what makes that path great game first, then ESOP so powerful as you you get into the rhythms and the culture and the patterns, and then all of a sudden you really are an owner, and it drives it up even more. Yeah. It's there is there is kind of a, a strange thing with this. I remember one time we had a company meeting and we were pretty we were very open. They used to say we were that uh, socialist ESOP in Iowa is what they used to call us. But um, anyway, we had a company meeting and one time I remember Tom stood up and this was back in the early 2000s and we were plastics manufacturers. So some. Some of the jobs were literally putting plastic components together. It wasn't a high tech or whatever. And he stood up in a company meeting and said, Victor, it's complete BS that everybody in this company doesn't make at least $10 an hour. He goes, it's just a crime. And he said it in front of everybody, 120 people. And I said, well, Tom, let's go down that path. And this is kind of that balance between owner. I said, okay, let's pay everybody 10 bucks an hour. I said, we'll do that. We'll raise everybody to 10 bucks an hour. But then, well, that'll, then our bonus is going to go down. Well, then somebody chimed up. Now, wait a second. That bonus, I need that. That bonus is important to me because of this, that, or whatever. Keep my wage where it is. I want that bonus because those bonuses are big. I said, okay, fine. We'll keep the bonuses. We'll do the $10 an hour. I said, we'll just let that stock value tank. Well, oh, God, oh, no, you can't do that. And I said, oh, you know, oh, my God. I said, okay, fine. We'll do all those things. We're just going to get rid of all the benefits. Forget the benefits. Well, you know, then again, and I think part of this to the question to the person out there, it's a balancing act. And I think sometimes people forget it's not right or wrong. It's where you're at in your journey through this employee ownership thing. You know, what stage are you in your career, the life choices you've made, because it can shift dramatically what's important. It can shift in a day that all of a sudden benefits are really important. And before that, benefits weren't important. So people forget. And I think within the great game community, even with the ESOP, sometimes we get so caught up in our own little thing. It's we got to we're trying to meet the needs of everybody. And that's a balancing act and there is, nobody will get it right. But I think it's that awareness that people understand. We, we want a good wage. We got to have a good wage to attract people. We like the bonuses. We, can, we want to give bonuses, but we can't kill our stock value. But also we got to have a good benefits package so that people that need the benefits. So it's all of that. And sometimes people forget it's not just the ESOP. It's just not the bonus. It's everything, folks. And remember that we're all at different stages 
And you, it's about learning to be an owner in the concept of it's the good of the whole versus the good of the one. When people start to focus on themselves, I think that's where you start to lose some of that synergy that you said, Randy, because they keep thinking about themselves and said, well, how does this balance out for everybody? Because everybody wants the best for them. But in reality, you got to think of what's best for everybody and then take what you get out of that broader perspective. Let's see here. Yeah, Victor, can I make a comment quick? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I never in 30 years thought of the great game of business and ESOP as two different entities. You know, I thought they were joined, joined at the hip because through given departmental meetings or staff meetings or whatnot, and uh, following the numbers and keeping the score and whatnot, you know, the employees get, get to a level where they understand, you know, the better your, your net income is, the better your quality is, et cetera, et cetera, the better your ESOP is going to be, the better the stock price is going to be, the better your contribution, you know. So to me, they went hand in hand. And you'd be surprised through the years, you know, when uh, uh, the first uh, shareholder meeting I went to when I first started, and the reason I went to because uh, they had a, a stock offering and I bought uh, X amount of shares of stock. So I went to the shareholders meeting and there was a handful of people in there, basically. And it just so happened that the share price doubled from like two and a half dollars a share or from five dollars a share, it doubled back down to two and a half. You know, so shoot, I'm in, uh, you know. And uh, it, just, it just escalated from that, but now we get, we're to the point towards the end of my, my career, Victor, when I walk down the hall, people are people are asking you, what's, what's the ESOP contribution going to be this year? What do you think our stock price is going to be? You know, we're taking we're taking wagers or uh, uh, playing games on who can get the closest to guess of what the stock value is. And uh, then you have your shareholders meeting, and it's an event. You know, there isn't a handful of people there. It is an event with more nerves and uh, beer tickets and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's something that, uh, at least in our division, everybody was talking about. And, you know, from, from where, from my first one to my last one, wow. I mean, what a difference. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Randy, I got, we got a question here for you specifically, if you're willing to, to spot on this. Um, Talking great job explaining ESOP and legacy for those people who are 100% owners. Could you explain how you came out financially compared to selling the company to a strategic buyer? You bet. Um, I mean, I mean, that was one of the things to look at. I, I receive, it's not really offers, but I have people our hospital is such a size that there's not a week that goes by, sometimes not a day that goes by that I don't get an email or a, or a phone call from somebody saying this equity group, I call the, the corporations Mars bars because Mars Candy Company owns much of veterinary medicine right now. I mean, it literally the Mars Candy Company, if you Banfield and VCA and Blue Pearl and a lot of, a lot of those guys. So um, so there is a lot of money flowing out there and they're paying a premium for veterinary hospitals like ours, less so in the small practices, but in our larger practices, there's a lot of money. I estimate that I got in, in this deal about half of what they would have paid. Um, and, and that's knowing specifically what, what, how many times they pay uh, times EBITDA and how much we did. And it was right, right about that. Um, but I mean, for me, and as I now am going forward and trying to show a different path, an alternate path to other veterinarians, to other veterinary hospitals, I think it's a better path. And my point is, you know, how, how much is, is enough? And, and that's sort of the way I, I looked at it. I, I, it's like, yeah, I don't, need, I don't need that much money to pass on to my kids that I don't really wanna pass on anyway. Um, and, and so it is, it, it's plenty what, 
what is uh, the fair market value. And that's what the ESOP does. It's a fair value for the company. There's, they look at that a number of different ways. And these other companies are paying premiums. There's some benefits to it. Now, the way that we did it, I, I mean, I can go into as much detail as we want. I don't want to bore anybody, but you can do it as a bank loan. You can do it as, uh, as a seller note and you can give the shares away. I've never believed in giving things away. Um, that's part of, of who I am, but I do, uh, I, I don't like working with banks. And so I actually, it was only about 20, I thought it'd be 40% is about 25% of a bank loan. I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna put myself through all the garbage of banks do to you. So I put that to the side and I did 100% seller note. Yep. And so with that, though, all of a sudden you can, you know, you pay, you receive a, a fair interest rate, but at an interest rate that's higher than uh, than probably I was even expecting. And so over the course of those 10 years, you make back a fair amount of that based on that. Now, it's not up front. I mean, when that's what some veterinarians are so tired. They say, I want to take the money and run and and. Uh, off into the sunset. But my point to the veterinarians is going to be and is um, do this for your team members. They helped you build this practice. They helped you build this business and let them be a part of it. Sell it to, to the employees. There's, the ESOP is a great method to do that. We, uh, we actually hired a marketing company to help us put the word out. Uh, Darren Dahl and others at Great Game are also helping us do that. But uh, we landed a, a front page uh, magazine article in today's veterinary business. And so that'll be coming out in December. We just completed that. And uh, it's, that's what it's going to talk about is the ESOP. Give the specifics of what we did and why it is good for, for veterinary medicine. And, and I think we could apply that to every business. I mean, it, SRC is a manufacturing company. That was one of my first thoughts. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not even close. There's nothing about me that's similar to SRC. Except for <laughs> we both have some great people. And, and honestly, that's what it takes. That's what it's about. It is about the people and getting people to work together to do something for themselves and for others. So it was kind of stated maybe, you know, that... Uh, reduction in what you get is maybe quote kind of the price of the culture that you want that you'd rather live in a culture that your people can thrive in and take a little less than maximizing your dollars at the cost of that culture yes is that a fair statement yep i think that's that is a fair statement yep and i've been doing this a lot of years and a lot of people ask the question of strategic buyer private equity and as you said you know your seller notes there's some other things along with that that you can close that delta between a strategic buyer and an esop and it, it, you know every market is different every seller is different every deal is different but um, it's just making sure you have a good team that can look at all that and really put it together because like you said it's dollars today versus dollars over a period of five, 10, 15, heck, even 20 years. Um, but uh, so it, it can be closer than what people think. But as you said, the amount of dollars that are being thrown at companies, all companies, existing ESOPs, it's big, big dollars. And so when you think about ESOP and legacy, it's making sure that you are financially solid to take care of the repurchase obligation and all those other things to where the ESOP is not running your business. The corporation, you know, you got to focus on the business. The thing about great game, what I tell people and people have brought this up, you know, they think uh, that ESOP solve everything, ownership mindset and all that. And I go, nah, good business, good ESOP. Bad business, bad ESOP. So focus on the business, which is great game, which gets you focused on the business, but it still focuses on ownership. But if you take your eye off that ball of the business and the ESOP becomes the driving factor of all your strategy, then I think you miss the boat and you can get sideways with your ESOP. It's a balancing act from day one. It never stops. You never get there. It's a journey, just like SRC's journey, Tom, just like you. It's a journey. I'm sure there are days when you walked out going, 
And then there are days when you walked out going, yeah. <laughs> and that's just human nature. Let me just see if I got any other questions. So, yeah. So Shane, um, we talked about this the other day as we were having the discussion. When, when did your ESOP account become significant to you? Was it just the vesting or was there kind of like, was there a, a number that all of a sudden you went, woo, that number finally, the number appeared and you go that, okay, this thing's real. I think it, you know, had a little bit to do with the both. I think the best thing seeing that, you know, I hit a hundred percent, that's when I really started paying attention. But like I hit on with the great leaders, I was fortunate that at the time when, you know, being younger and I'm still feeling out the ESOP or whatnot, I had somebody in the corporation who wasn't, you know, too much older than me. He was a younger guy who had been with the company for a while. Same story. had built himself up and he was in a very good position and he was comfortable enough with showing me his ESOP. And when I saw the significance of it and him being a hundred percent and, you know, knowing that I was not really too far off from that. The only thing that separated us was time in the company. And so I think for me, that was a huge eye opener as in, you know, I can make this happen. This could be uh, real for me. And then also knowing a younger guy with that amount already in his ESOP, you know, if he's going to work to retirement age, who knows what his ESOP could have been. Mm -hmm. So and one of that's the reason I ask that is I tell everybody, you know, significance is in the eye of the beholder. And it also depends on how much you're putting into your ESOP. You know, some ESOPs only put in two or three percent of pay. Some ESOPs put in 10 to 12 percent. I know ESOPs that have been putting in 25 percent of comps since day one, and they've been an ESOP for 25 years. So there's a wide variation, but it's not until that number is significant. And Tom, you probably had that moment, too, somewhere back there where all of a sudden you looked at that account and went, now this and maybe it was the vesting. But was it after vesting or was it really the vesting or was there some number was, after there where you went, oh, now that number, I'm not letting go of that number. Yeah, it, it was the vesting and, and uh, agree with Shane. Once you became 100 percent vested, it means a lot, a lot more, because now really with that money in there, it, it was your decision to stay with the company or take your money and run. You know, yeah. now if you stay with the company, you're going to help build, build that nest egg, yeah. you know, which which most most people do. You know, so, uh, and then it's just about accumulating, accumulating shares, in my opinion, Victor, you know, your contributions, the better the company does, the contributions you get on an annual basis, all of a, all of a sudden, you know, you go from 500 shares after several years to now you're sitting on two or 3,000 shares after 15, 20 years, you know, and then that stock value goes up five, ten $10 or whatnot, and that's where the, the hooping and Howard it starts because all of a sudden they seen their ESOP jump 25, 50 grand, you know, and that's where the, you know, it really starts sinking, sinking in then. Yeah. Well, we're getting, we're down to our last 15 minutes. I don't know. You guys probably aren't even looking at the clock, but time flies when you're having fun. So um, as we start to wrap up, why don't we, Randy, maybe I can start with you. Any words of wisdom or thoughts or commentary for the audience out there as regard to how you look at ESOP and legacy and any advice or input you'd like to, to give the audience. We'll start with you. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's what we've been talking about. So I'm trying to think of how not to re-say some of the same things. I don't, I don't know that I can can do that. I, uh, I'm obviously sold on on this pathway of of the ESOP. Um, the future for us is unknown. I mean, uh, people, honestly, I feel like people at, at uh, my hospitals have a lot of trust, and they see what the past has been. They see that we've done things right, and that we have done things with a mind to, to their needs as well as the pets needs and the clients needs. Um, one of the things that I absolutely have learned to love about the great game of business is that everyone that I have met 
truly cares about their people. And that's a culture that I love being in because what that does, I'm, I'm telling you, that money is not very important, but happiness and we happiness comes from serving others, from doing good. And that's where business owners will have the most joy. I mean, when I just talked about an ESOP and I had a half a dozen or more people come up and hug me that had never hugged me before. <laughs> me because of that, that was what was in my heart. They didn't even know we were going to do it, uh, you know, but I, we do what we're, we talk about. We do what we say we're going to do. And so that's the future. And, and I'm excited about it. You don't, I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen in the country and the economy, but but when you have people pulling together, I, I, that's why I, I love that saying, Jack Stack. I mean, you can stop one guy, but you can't stop a hundred. And that's what it feels like is I've got 300 people and we're going full speed ahead. I don't care what Mars Bars is doing. We have a better culture. We have better service by far than what they have. I mean, people love coming here. So and anyway, I, I think that uh, both the, the Great Game and the ESOP are are really a great combination and I, I can't say it's for every company but i can say that for us it is a really good deal and for my people for, for all our team members uh, who are a part of our large family it is going to be a blessing to them there's someone that don't even have a clue what an opportunity this is and i don't care i, I mean we're moving ahead we'll show it to them over the years that this was the right move so with that, thank you, Victor. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. Shane? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the hardest things for me being in it as a supervisor, I get all sorts of different walks of life, uh, young people, older people. And the hardest part is getting them to see the value of the ESOP, um, you know, right away. Because those first two, three years, they're, whenever they get a certificate, it's going to show 0%. And, you know, they may not see the value in it at that time. And I think it is so important to talk, um, you know, to just preach it and to talk about real life things, like take stuff that you've heard in this discussion today and, you know, tell them that, you know, Randy, he has 300 people and it's completely changing his business and everything. Um, for me, I have a friend uh, who had worked at SRC he took his ESOP and now he has a food truck. He owns it. You know, that's what he wanted to do. He's not able to do that without his ESOP. You know, I know all these uh, retired guys, like the one next to me, you know, he's doing, doing what he wanted to do. He's got a life that, and, you know, ESOP has helped contribute to that. And I think um, getting people to think like an owner and helping them see their future, you know, just saying the ESOP is a great thing. You know, it, that's not going to help them. You need to give those real life examples um, or how you know that it's going to affect. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, real life examples, those are a great way uh, to show the benefit of the ESOP. Thank you, sir. Tom? Yeah, Victor, I'll echo kind of what Randy and Shane feels and, and which to me is a big part of your ESOP or great game in business and that they actually genuinely care about the people uh, that are, they work with or the people that are in their company. And that, to me, that is, uh, that is a secret, you know, and, and uh, if you do that, show them respect, you'll get respect. You know, you teach, have patience and teach them the number and teach them the outcome, how their little job over here impacts the big, uh, the bottom line on your income statement, uh, they'll get it. They'll put the, they'll play, you know, it's frustrating at times. It's not all uh, rose petals, you know, on the way to retirement for, for sure. You're, you know, there's like you mentioned, there's days you just like to run out of there screaming, you know, but you get over those and then for sure uh, the good days way, way outweigh the rough days, you know, uh, the more people that uh, understand the numbers and track them, the more frustrations are going to be because they they're following the business, they're keeping score, and when things are going south, yeah, people you get frustrated and there's a little anxiety, and this is how we work through them. You know, everybody's got their piece of pie. Make your piece of pie bigger, and uh, we'll be fine. 
But uh, what I think about it, I mean, my oldest son, uh, he's in his 11th year at SRC, and we talked earlier. A lot of my friends, you know, they, they've got sons and daughters working there, and I, I was thinking in the back of my head just how many, and I thought, wow, you know, there's a lot of family members that got their, their uh, uh, kids working at SRC in one division or another. I mean, it's a, it's a ton, which uh, says volumes to me about uh, the type of atmosphere uh, that we create. So I, I was very blessed to come across SRC. Well, that was great. Thanks, everybody. And, um, you know, when you, you said there were how many people, that would be interesting. I would it'd be interesting for SRDC to share how many second or third generation folks they have in there. That would be a great piece of data. I'll throw that out to Mr. Baker or Mr. Armstrong. That would be some good data, gentlemen, to uh, get out there, because I do think it's one of the challenges in, in thinking about it. Your stories today, folks, because I'm pretty passionate about all of this. I've been living it for a long time, and any chance I get to promote employee ownership and making a difference, I do. Because I think you said it well, Randy. It's about bringing about the best in others and helping people be successful. And is it hard? Yes, it is. And Tom, you said it. It's not a bed of roses all the time. But if your belief is that, that it's for the greater good and that you can make a difference, then, you know, employee ownership is a very powerful tool. And again, Randy, you said it good. It's not for everybody because not everybody, it's a lot of work. You know, when you practice great game and you practice ownership, it's about having an adult to adult relationship with people that you can debate things, you can challenge things in a respectful way, and then you walk away. And some people just want to tell people what to do. And some people just want to be told what to do. And, and there's nothing wrong with that if that's where you want. But when you talk about ownership, it's about dueling it out in your own head. It's dueling it out with your peers respectfully, because you never know where that great idea is going to come from, whether it increases your chances to get the bonus, you know, great game bonus, or increases the stock value or increases so a new brand new business that you want to get into or a subsidiary, the power is in all the people's minds. It's not in any one person's mind. So um, one other thing, folks, for people that are out there, there's a white paper that the great game has out there on their, on their site. It's called the ground rules for building an enduring company. Ground rules for building an enduring company. So if you, Want some more data on a white paper kind of along these lines? You can go out there and get that or contact somebody at GGOB and they can get that to you, but it's out there for you. Um, we're going to get done here a little early, but I've never been on any event or program where if we get done a little early that people go, oh, they shortchanged me. So we are going to finish um, a little bit earlier. But Randy, Tom, Shane, thank you so much. Thanks for being open and honest. There's many comments on here for your frankness that the audience liked that. And that's the way I am. So thank you so much for contributing and spending this hour and a half with us. Great game. Thanks for putting this all together for the audience and everybody. And I assume there will be an ESOP roundtable for sometime here in the future. And who knows what the topic will be, but with Kylie and the group there working on it, I'm sure it'll be a good one. So thanks, everybody, and have a great, great day. Thank you, Victor. Thank yep. you, Victor. Thank uh -huh. you, Randy. Thank you.